Hello everyone, uh, it's Thursday the 18th of June and um, this is our 8th uh, CST lockdown webinar. Thank you so much for joining us and for being with us today. Um, today's um, theme um, is, is called Resilience Across Borders, Transfrontier Collaboration for Integrating Conservation and Livelihoods. And we've got an exciting um, group of people together um, that will share their experiences and um, yeah, of, of what they do normally, but also what they do now under lockdown and in the time of COVID. Also, just to say, um, the CST, Center for Complex Systems and Transition, is an interdisciplinary research center based in Stellenbosch. And one of the projects that we're working on and that's funding also the series is USAID and Resilient Waters, a project based under that. And our partners are actually joining us today on this um, webinar. We are very excited to be um, meeting some of them for the first time and learning from what you're doing, but also being able to collaborate and exchange in this way. So thank you very much for all of you. We'll start, I'll, I'll, I'll just start to say who our um, panelists are today. So we have Christy Masajewski, um, sitting in Stellenbosch, but working in, in uh, Joburg <laughs> at Resilient Waters. We have Piet Tron, um, who's the international coordinator for the Great Limpopo Transport Frontier Park and Conservation Area. He's also joining us from Joburg. And we have Lola Lopez, who's um, joining us from Maputo in Mozambique. Uh, she's the project implementation coordinator for the USAID project there. So thank you very much, all of you, for being with us. And I'll ask Christy maybe to start and just give us some kind of introduction of who you are, what your work is, and just give us some context from what the project is about. Rika. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So as Rika introduced, my name is Christine um, the Divided by Waters Program. So the Resilient Waters Program is a USAID funded program where the aim is to build resilient communities and resilient ecosystems in Southern Africa. Um, and as a biodiversity advisor, my, my role is to really lead program activities that promote the conservation of biodiversity ecosystem resilience and improved natural resource management in key biodiversity um, areas. So as a program, we have quite a big footprint. We work across six different countries, but our work is mostly based in the Okavango River Basin and in the Limpopo River Basin. And our scope of work cannot be possible without our key consort consortium partners that we work with. So we work very closely with the River Basin Water Commissions and the Transfrontier Conservation Areas. In Okavango, we work with the Okakom and Kaza, the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area. And in Limpopo River Basin, we work with Limcom and then the GLTFCA, the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area, which Pete and Lola will chat about more in today's webinar. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that, Christy. Pete, would you like to continue? Yes, thank you, uh, Rika. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, my name is Peter Ron. So, I'm the current uh, what they call the International Coordinator for the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area. So essentially what I do is I help, um, so it's a three country program, I'll give you some background uh, later, and I basically coordinate all the joint activities, so activities that are relevant to two or three of the countries. Um, so the countries Mozambique, uh, South Africa and Zimbabwe, they are represented through a joint management board which is five people per country, and then we report to a ministerial committee, and then we've got different advisory and implementation co committees or structures under us. So I'll just today just quickly talk to you around, a little bit around COVID-19 and how we're trying to, what we've done so far and how we're trying to approach it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pit. And Lola, please introduce yourself and the work that you're doing there. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Rika. My name is Lola Lopez. I am the Project Implementation Coordinator for the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area. I am um, based in Maputo, Mozambique, and um, I am uh, hired by the Resilient Waters Program. Um, my job is to assist uh, Pete Teron, the International Coordinator for the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area, in implementing and rolling out the work plan. Um, and uh, today I will be talking to you a little bit about some of the things that are happening uh, during these days on the ground. Great. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, thank you also for being with us uh, from far away. It's super great that we can, that we can share this, this conversation together. So um, 
I've sort of just, you know, kind of a sort of preparing a little bit for this conversation. We've just had one or two or three sort of broad questions that we thought could be interesting for today's discussion. And I think the first one really is about, um, you know, what is the challenges of your job that you usually do? Um, and how does how does COVID and the sort of this, this whole lockdown scenario, how is that changing, um, you know, your the challenges and the responses that you've been faced with the last few few months? And we'll just ease, ask, ask each discussant maybe to reflect on that uh, briefly. Christy, are you, do you have, do you want to start with that? Thank you, Rika. The biggest challenge I think from our side is our footprint. We work across a very, very big area and, um, and our inability to move at the moment is making it really difficult. So a lot part of it, our work is about implementing activities on the ground and now with the lockdown and closing international borders, we are unable to move out to the countries. Um, so it's kind of caused us or forced us to, to think a bit more differently about how do we carry on? How can we implement projects and, and how can we still carry on as normal? Because we still need to. And I think what has been really insightful is that we've realized how much we can rely on our team. And we have embedded staff in all the countries, um, in, in all, most, of, most of the six countries. Um, and working with the people in the Water River Basin Commissions and the Transfrontier Parks. Um, and even though everyone has restricted movement at that level, there is a collaboration, there is a network that takes place. So it's been really amazing, I think, to, to see that. And I think Pete and Lola can speak more from what's happening on the ground because they, they are there. I think especially Lola being in Mozambique and the challenges that she faces in Mozambique are very different to what we face in South Africa. So I think also the regional program is being cognizant of these different national and regional and transboundary challenges. It's not just one country we're dealing with, we're dealing with six. So I think that's been quite a challenge. Wow. That sounds, yeah, that sounds huge. Pete, did you want to follow up on that? Yes, I can, um, Rika, if I might, just quickly want to share a presentation. Um, So just to provide some context, so so really, um, can everyone see this? Can you see this, uh, Rika? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. So it's so we essentially, like I said earlier, a three-country project, um, which consists uh, it's the partner countries of Mozambique, South Africa, and Zimbabwe, and there's a core area which is uh, shown in this map here: Limpopo Park, Kruger National Park, and Gondolazo National Park, and that. An area called the Sengwetcha Peace Corridor through Zimbabwe, linking Kongarazo with uh, Zimbabwe. And then we've got a number of institutional uh, arrangements uh, through a treaty that was established and signed by the heads of state in 2002. And then we're also currently looking at, at adding areas to the core or to the broader project. And these are communal areas, private sector and, and government areas in all three countries. But essentially what we've, um, <clears throat> this is basically just our institutional arrangement. So we've got a coordinating party, which is the country, which is currently Zimbabwe. And then we've got a ministerial committee, a joint management board, which I spoke about earlier, and then national entities, and also then uh, a secretariat. So I'm currently a war representing the secretariat, myself and Lola, but there's a process to develop a more permanent secretariat. But what I really want to show you is, um, so these are just, we've got implementation committees that are on the ground. And then we've got national structure. So we essentially, uh, you know, we are coordinating structure. So we, we basically work through national structures, mostly existing structures. And that's also our, um, you know, our approach to what, everything that we do and also in terms of COVID. So in terms of our broad, uh, work plan, we've got nine themes, uh, governance, administration, conservation, wildlife management, security, wildlife protection, land use planning and management, tourism, community development, integrated resource management, marketing communications, and joint training. So what we've basically done um, in trying to address this current pandemic, we looked at our work plan. So we essentially... You know, COVID responses are implemented on a country level. So we can't, as an entity, as a GLTFCA or the board, really implement. We can only support and share information and try and see what 
the current uh, situation means uh, for our work plan, our thematic areas. So what we've tried to do, what we're busy doing is we set up a task team and working groups, and we've basically looked at looking at three, of three broad areas, community health, well-being, livelihoods, and food security, tourism, hospitality, and the wildlife economy, and then conservation management, wildlife protection, security. And we've realized now, uh, you know, we've also, we've got some really good partners in our landscape, uh, USAID, we have four landscape programs being one of them. So we've also now tried to set up a forum to align the communication between us and the partners much uh, you know, better and also to see how the partners can align uh, themselves better in the landscape by providing a platform uh, around that. And then we're also looking at uh, knowledge sharing and uh, how we can improve our communication. But essentially what we've done through that is we now started looking at our priorities and how what that means uh, what's the impact on, on COVID and what that means going forward so what we've done is we looked at at scale so we looked at interventions on a broader TFCA three country scale and then we tried to identify specific nodes and this is just the example so we highlighted specific activities that are urgent or immediate and they all as you can see mostly around food and water security and then we're looking at the recovery phase which is Pretty unknown at the moment but we estimate maybe 18 months um, and then in doing that we basically set up a partners forum which is our 13 or 14 key partners in the landscape and it's quite inclusive so it's not defined to only these partners but we also can bring people in as we go and then now we're about to set up five working groups looking at these thematic areas so security wildlife protection conservation wildlife management community health livelihoods water and food security, tourism, hospitality, and wildlife economy. And then actually an interesting thing that came up is that we are now setting up a separate working group around human and wildlife conflict. So, I mean, that's, I think that's for now all from my side. Thanks, uh, Rika. Thanks for sharing, um, Pete. Uh, that looks quite <laughs> exhaustive in, in terms of, you know, what, what you're trying to, to keep together or hold together, but uh, for, for it's also amazing to see the different themes and then the structures that, that try to address those. Thank you very much. Lola, um, would you like to share? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, both uh, Christy and Pete already covered, uh, you know, they provided with a big umbrella and the whole overarching um, uh, scenario. Um, what happens in the ground, especially with this, with the current scenario that we're living um, is, um, it's very realistic, and I think uh, as a group uh, that you know where we find ourselves actively uh, working with people in the ground, uh, we have um, very quickly realized that uh, the one size fits all approach is not something that we can put in practice in a scenario where the one binding instrument that we have in you know uh, for the GLTFCA is a uh, you know high level trilateral agreement. Um, so we have to have a very personalized approach to the different, to our clients, to the different uh, countries where we are working. Um, I'd like to share a little bit experience, you know, of, of Mozambique being in the ground. Um, we are slightly behind South Africa. We have just over 600 uh, positive COVID cases at the moment and uh, three deaths uh, directly associated. Um, and, uh, but we're talking about a scenario where we, are, where we have about 21,000 tested individuals. Um, and I think it's very similar scenario for both Mozambique and Zimbabwe. And the question is always, if we had the capacity to test more, would we be looking at higher numbers? Um, but regardless of that, you know, there's been, uh, there's been great effort. And I think as a uh, as, as Pete um, mentioned, there's been an exercise where very, very quickly, you know, just days after the pandemic spread out, we got together as a team and we were able to do this prioritization uh, exercise. Um, in Mozambique, uh, such as in South Africa, one of the first effects that we were able to see was uh, tourism. Within the first 30 days, um, not under, so still under the uh, soft uh, lockdown that we are currently in, um, so under 30 days of this system, we had the major uh, hotels closing in the capital city. 
Um, but we are a very, we're not, our tourism economy is not comparable or tourism, tourism, touristic economy um, or sector is not comparable to that of South Africa, it's still very small. Um, however, you know, there are some very good examples of how this collaboration um, has had some really good uh, um, uh, results. And uh, some of these, has, I would like to highlight the area of security, where, for example, um, um, you know, the, this being really now a lockdown period. This morning I was talking to the director of uh, Protection and Law Enforcement of Mozambique, uh, ANAC, which is the um, equivalent to Sun Parks um, in South Africa. And uh, he was telling me that indeed they have no lock lockdown and they're not feeling it. And this is because more than, that, more than ever, they need to be ready and we need to have, you know, field rangers on both sides on the, of the border and ready for cross-border actions to protect uh, wildlife. Um, it is also known that in this uh, regard, in the beginning of the lockdown in early March, there was an increase of uh, poaching on both sides, South Africa and Mozambique, and that was a little bit uh, worrisome but the number is very quickly decreased. And I think uh, parties in both sides agree that maybe uh, criminal networks were under the impression that uh, less focus was going to be given to, um, to security forces on the ground by the field rangers in a moment where a lot of uh, attention would be directed to the response of COVID. Um, so yes, yeah, so overall very difficult days. Um, uh, there are some risks uh, still in terms of uh, security in the whole scenario where we work. One of them is that works very well in the sector is that uh, with security in conservation areas, you're ensuring uh, social distance. But uh, eventually in countries like Mozambique where uh, human power is uh, limited and a challenge, uh, we are scared that uh, you know, if, if the virus reaches communities, um, that it can have uh, significant losses uh, for, for security on the Mozambican side. And um, I think lastly, um, one, another risk that is very quickly identified is that people are losing jobs and people in communities are very, very hungry. And uh, one of the quickest threats we're going to be seeing is an increase in the poaching or the illegal hunting of bushmeat. And um, this is... Uh, you know, this is part of what the whole discussion on wildlife economy is. Um, you know, communities uh, need to feel uh, the need to be part of this whole discussion. And this is when we really need to stop and, and look around us and see that, you know, communities are, are hungry. So that is a risk that I know uh, on both sides um, has been pointed out as, uh, as something to see in the near future, you know, happening right now. So thank you. Mm, thank you for sharing. Yeah, I think it's amazing to hear, you know, what is coming out and what is what, what people are reverting to and what are what are sort of the main issues that people can tackle in these times and or not. Um, I see sort of just on, on, a, on our participants list, I don't want to um, exclude anyone, but I just wanted to say hi also to G Georgina Candle from, from Canada, who got up early to join us. Hi, George, and thanks for being with us. Um, and I'm asking everyone to, if you have questions, we'll, we'd love to ask, answer some questions and get some, some interactive exchange going. Um, please post your questions in the Q&A box right um, at the bottom of your screen. There's a little Q&A. And if you post them there, we can monitor them and see them a little bit better. Yeah, so it, I mean, it, it seems that the task at hand is quite um, diverse and that in this time, um, a lot of the challenges need different kinds of responses, but also there, I'm sure there's some interesting sort of innovation or some interesting on the ground things that are happening um, that you might want to share with us. Um, some wow ideas, some, some insights that you've had. Um, I'm just opening up the panel to, to yeah, anyone that would, would like to share what, what are sort of positive um, outcomes or positive unintended uh, ways in which you've tried to respond to challenges in this time. Bit. I mean, I can go first, uh, yeah. Rika. I've, I've had a wow moment. Good. <laughs> <It's a couple laughs> well, you again. Um, I want to go back to a, a presentation. So, um, so what we did actually, you know, there was a program um, 
Steve will remember, and Kulet. So uh, the, the, pre the precursor to Resilient Waters was a program called uh, Resilum, um, which is also funded by USAID. And they helped us in partnership uh, with the Peace Park Foundation to develop a livelihood strategy for the GLTFCA, which, um, which was developed uh, and finalized maybe a year, or, a year or two ago. And essentially what we've done now uh, in the meantime, we've, you know, it's always a lag time between uh, developing some sort of a thinking around a strategy and actually mobilizing resources to implement it. And actually, strangely enough, this beginning of this year, we actually now started getting resources, um, you know, a lot from the from the USA programs and resilient waters to implement the strategy. But what I've realized actually um, now looking at the strategy, um, you know, again and, and and thinking how we can take it forward, um, it's essentially got five objectives. So one around protecting uh, and restoring natural resources. Second one about enhancing communities' ability to capture these benefits. Third one around uh, you know, giving people choices uh, through developing the social capital. Fourth one around uh, partnerships and institutions. And the fifth one around uh, strengthening governance capacity. And we started unpacking these, um, these into um, <clears throat> sort of sub themes. So you'll see, and it's just, and what I realized looking at these objectives and, and sub themes is that we actually got a really, really good uh, strategy. And even, uh, and, and, you know, and, and it also dawned on me if, if we, if we implement the strategy, you know, going forward, or if we started implementing it uh, before COVID, it's actually, it, it's, it, uh, it will definitely build resilience um, in these communities because we essentially, what we try to achieve from the outset is not developing a strategy only around the wildlife economy or the biodiversity economy, but we wanted to look at livelihoods in the broader sense. And um, yeah, I just realized, you know, the table I showed you earlier on uh, around what we're trying to think around prioritization, around response to COVID, and then looking at the strategy, um, you know, it was just, it's just dawned on me again that we actually did, we've got a really pretty good strategy. We just need to implement it. And it's it definitely built resilience on a local and a, and a sort of a regional level. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. What I like about your diagram, it seems that those five points or those five focus areas, they are basically the capacities to build resilience. So if you build those capacities, that would define what you would think resilience would mean in your project. And I like how you've sort of put them out in circles with, you know, um, arrows in a nice way that, that, that shows that these things are, they are touching each other and they are somehow, I wouldn't say connected, but they are together, they form like an ecology of what would, what would five areas be that if you strengthen those, you could speak about a kind of a resilient landscape. Yeah, I mean, I think also what, I mean, so I like to think what's going to come out of COVID is there's going to be a bigger emphasis on, on developing vibrant rural economies, because I think we need to make these, these landscapes in the rural areas more productive and more organized and try and keep people, uh, provide more opportunities for people in these landscapes to develop businesses and create jobs. Because you, you essentially want to, you want people to live there and make it more productive from a food and water security point of view and actually try and not let people go to, to towns and cities to actually go and, uh, you know, look at the livelihood options. So I definitely think that these these broader landscapes area is going to play a much bigger role or, or get more support and there's definitely opportunity to make more productive you know both from a from a wildlife economy and from a food security and from a water security point of view going forward so i think uh, that's definitely one of the one of the emerging uh, issues uh, or, or focus points from from COVID. thanks christy do you want to add to that I just want to quickly add on, I think what, what, what Peter's saying and what's really highlighting me, it's the, the key word is diversity. And I think if we come back to like, you know, the principles for building resilience, we've always thought about diversity in terms of an ecological landscape. You know, having, having an indigenous forest is more, it's more resilient to a fire than like a plantation because it's the different types of trees. And, but it's, it's interesting thinking about in terms of the livelihoods, having diversified livelihood strategies also makes the system resilient. So I, I quite like that. 
sorry, it's all I'm say. Yeah, no, thank you. So it's it's sort of, I think what 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 we are seeing in the COVID uh, experience is that diversity on all levels sort of is becoming much more important than uh, you know than just being. A, so it's it's the sort of trade off between expertise or focus versus diversity in, in many aspects of life um, and option to have options it seems seems to be really key at this stage and whether it's in building partnerships or looking at livelihoods or resources or you know, even pers on a personal level being you know how we, how we manage and how we how we sort of make decisions are based on the kinds of choices that we have and how diverse they are thanks lola what are what are your insights here Um, yes, Rika. I was uh, having a look at the, uh, uh, the, the question and answer uh, section and I saw that there was a comment from uh, um, Reason um, asking, about, um, asking about how we are able to adapt to the different uh, socioeconomic situations of the different countries that we work in. So I wanted to share an example of uh, when, when, when we were, uh, right in the beginning, when we were in this prioritization uh, um, exercise, um, the discussion that was happening in the South African side was about, uh, you know, a delivery of uh, food baskets, you know, these um, emergency yeah. food baskets to the family of the rangers. And uh, on the Mozambican side, you know, what we were talking about is just the very trendy tippy toe, uh, tippy taps and the soap. So this is the reality and this is how we have to deal with it. And uh, we are all on the same boat and we all have to make sure that we're rowing more or less at the same, uh, at the same rhythm, but we will be encountering different realities in, for the three different uh, uh, countries. But uh, there will always be uh, room uh, for, for learning and the, the exchange of experiences that is always very um, rich to, to the three uh, participant countries. Thank you. No, that's a good remark between how the responses are and how these different responses are being um, are valued and uh, you know, what's coming in from them. Yeah. Would any of you like to maybe add any, any, any of those add to any of that or shall we try and um, go to some of the questions I think our, our third question for, for that we've just discussed maybe we, let's just go there um, for those of you um, who are waiting for it for the questions to be answered and I'm seeing that there are nice questions coming in but we'll have a lot of time I think to respond to those I think what what COVID has also sort of opened up is this this huge feeling and this huge sense of uncertainty and you know how systems respond in shock you, you know um, is there any kind of um, understanding or insights or learnings that you've that you've seen um, in your in your pro projects and in the different responses that you've been engaging with that you could think about or share with us on you know what's coming out and how to deal with uncertainty in a certain way, Christy? I think um, we are we in a fortunate position, and I think working with um, such a region program across different countries but I think also working in the GLTFCA is that you have the opportunity to work across these different scales and so you know you have to you have different pressures and different drivers at like a local scale immediate scale so geographically local but also temporally you need to react straight away um, and then you're also kind of looking at different pressures at at a regional scale for example in Kruger National Park um, and then at a national scale South Africa versus Zimbabwe and Mozambique and then at a GLTFCA, you work in a transboundary scale. And I think that is, that is a real challenge in this. Um, and everyone expects responses, um, short-term responses, medium responses, long-term responses. So you have to be aware of all these scales. And I think if you can identify where do you, what kind of innovation, what kind of work can you do at that scale, that you can then scale up to the next scale. That is probably the what would build resilience in the system. So it's identifying those cross-scale linkages um, which is, yeah, it's really, it's really challenging. And it's been really challenging to, to have like such an, a pandemic and how you try and work at it across these different scales in such a big landscape. So it's really huge. Thanks. So that's where the, yeah, the, also the strengthening of partnerships come in. Kit. Yeah, I just want to show you um, actually one more slide. And I promise yeah. you that's the slide. Uh, so when we developed the, the livelihoods, um, just following on what, uh, what Christy was saying, when we developed this um, livelihood strategy, we actually developed this uh, uh, 
the diagram around the three tiered cake. Um, and so what we've done in our libraries process, I didn't show it, but we actually, you know, we actually were grappling with the issue around scale uh, for some, quite some time. And then we started looking at uh, the whole TFCA and then breaking it down to nodes and then these, in these nodes, basically community and, and household levels. But what we've realized is that we you know, firstly have to basically, you need to invest in all three tiers to actually build uh, sustainability or resilience. <clears throat> So you need to basically invest in, 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 in things that will is relevant to households and things that are relevant to communities and then things that create a more enabling environment uh, around uh, from a regional perspective. And what we looked at, I mean, I was looking at the comments earlier, so there were some comments around uh, communities and how do you connect them across borders and, and water security and the role uh, of, of women and, and youth. So what we've, what we're trying to do, um, but we obviously we, we still got a long way to go. As we try to look at governance as a key aspect. So, for instance, in the Pafuri Singwe node, where the three countries uh, meet, and where I mean, I saw Vince was on the call, where he's basically based. We're looking at governance and how we can actually create these cross-border governance structures that are inclusive, that mean, that also provide for community representation, traditional leader representation, and all the relevant stakeholders in these nodes. Um, what we also uh, realized is that we need to work and put a lot of emphasis on working with the youth because the youth is the future of conservation. And we also try and, you know, from a livelihood development perspective, you often find uh, in these rural communities, women are, are, are strong, strong leaders and, uh, and they are basically the drivers of livelihoods in those regions and those areas. So we, you know, you, through our governance structures, we want to make it also inclu inclusive and make put a lot of focus on on, uh, on women and, and the youth. And then what we also uh, what we actually interesting enough uh, did. I um, mean, I saw there was a comment around water resource management, and that's something we're busy now exploring with resilient waters. We don't actually have an integrated water resource management um, strategy, but we're busy setting one up. But what we looked. Uh, like, for instance, in the Pafuri Sengwe node, at some stage through this livelihoods uh, strategy process, we did a ecosystem services analysis. And what, um, and what we tried to do is, is look at different scenarios, look at climate change and look at drivers of, 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 uh, of, of livelihoods in that area. And uh, what came out of that study is that by, four, by far, um, if you look at the ecosystem services that forms the foundation, uh, you know, in these rural areas of life. It's water was by far the most important one, but by a mile. So we now are trying to, you know, so one of our key uh, areas, focus areas currently, and it actually, it's very prominent in a lot of these COVID response uh, mitigation plans is, is the focus on water and water provision and, and water security. Um, yeah, so those are just some of my comments around that. Thanks. So it's, I think having that kind of visual understanding of what cross scale means also also helps and to see exactly how those are broke, broken down in specific areas and focus domains. Thank you very much for that. Lola, it seems that you've been um, checking out the, the questions. Would you like to um, have a response and, and then look at the few questions? I, I think, yes, I, I was doing that, but I think Peter had answered uh, also most of them, so I'm really happy also to hear that. Um, maybe just, you know, pin, pin out that uh, indeed it is good and it's a good momentum to talk about the role of women in conservation. And, uh, you know, also even looking at the, in the sector of uh, security, um, it is becoming, you know, more prominent to see players like the uh, women, the members in South Africa, um, and also in Zimbabwe, you know, there is there is room for, for women to shine, not only within their communities and as good administrators for very scarce resources, but also to have a very prominent role in, in conservation. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I wanted to, to share. And also just to, you know, highlight again that uh, um, on the point uh, raised uh, by our colleagues, Steve, uh, on, on communities that are divided by, by border, um, you, you know, I, I think, you know, you probably know this, uh, the answer to this better than I do, but the same way that uh, these borders caused, uh, uh, you know, families and surnames to, to, in Shangan cultures to, 
to divide. It's also happened uh, uh, with the wildlife. And we heard recently while talking about, you know, the development of the elephant management framework, that we're talking about family of, of families of uh, elephants that have had roots for, you know, years and years and decades. And this is within their DNA. So I think your question is super valid, but not only looking at, you know, people in communities and the difference between the Tembisa on yours on the South African side and the Tembes on the Mozambican side. It's also really about, you know, the wildlife, you know, it's, it's really one whole, one single union. And I think part of our efforts is to really try to put down those virtual borders and, and you know, work as independent nations, but also in a place where there is uh, synergies for us to be able to operate together. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just going to have a look at some of the questions. They're quite broad and quite diverse at this stage, but it seems that there's uh, one or two questions about integrated water management. And just uh, looking at David and a few others and people's questions about what are, what are the, what is, so, so maybe one question coming to you in, in, in two parts, but it's sort of what is the role of the integrated water management plan uh, to secure water security in this area and what are the aims and how, do one, how does one achieve this? Basically, the question is, how does this integrated water management plan work, or is it working? And maybe also, what are the roles of um, river basin organizations in, in this space? Anyone, I'm opening up the floor to any one of you. Yeah, I can answer that. So, um, so we've, uh, I mean, it's three years, we've, we've obviously, uh, I mean, Kruger, had a, Kruger National Park's got a rivers program, and there's been quite a lot of, uh, a fair amount of interaction between uh, South Africa and Mozambique around water management issues, but we've never, as a TFCA, formalized it. So we're in the process of formalizing it. And it's something that Resilient Waters is working uh, with us. Um, and it's driven by uh, the main person dri driving this. Uh, so we want to develop a strategy, an integrated water resource management strategy uh, for all three countries, for the whole GLTFCA, and then also look at how we can collaborate more closer to these water management agencies and the river basin, basin organizations. So we, uh, so there's a Eddie Riddell, Dr. Eddie Riddell from Kruger National Park is helping us putting together um, the strategy, but we're in early stages. So, so we're basically working with, with the resilient waters. Um, the, the part that's currently on the ground that's being uh, more active. So we're developing a broader strategy, but, Part of that uh, strategy is also um, a process that Steve Collins and Lola is involved with is looking at some of these dams um, in Mozambique in the TFCA and developing uh, resource use and zoning plans uh, for those dams. So Lola and Steve, is, they're currently working on the Massengir Dam, which is the dam in the, uh, in the Olifants River in Mozambique. It's bordering uh, Kruger, Limpopo Park and area called the Great Bombers Conservancy. So that's an immediate focus and that's work that's currently underway that's funded by Resilient Waters. Thanks. It seems that um, yeah, a lot of these things need to happen on different levels. So it's establishing the partnerships, but then also formaliza the formalization of things so that can have some kind of policy and management responses. Lola, you had your hands on the mic. Yes, uh, I wanted to uh, comment a little bit on the question uh, put up by Vince, and uh, there was also an, a similar question on poaching moving forward, what, what seems to be the, the trends. And this is very difficult questions because we don't know. And uh, there's, you know, there's a side, uh, there's, we're dealing with the demand side. And, uh, and uh, what we expect uh, of the Asians now, with this, the banning of uh, this natural of these uh, uh, products derived from uh, from um, illegal wildlife trade for medicinal purposes, we don't know to what extent it's going to have uh, an effect. And uh, and the same questions that we're asking to the demand on the Asian side is the same questions that maybe we should apply in ourselves as the local consumers of this. Maybe not on that uh, bigger scale. But it's exactly your question. When we go out there a little bit away from the capital city, we have, uh, we have markets where we are able to find uh, a lot of these products. So the question is really, 
um, you know, to what extent are we able to influence uh, uh, cultural issues and really uh, change this, uh, this uh, mindset uh, towards a more sustainable approach. Uh, so I think we're talking about a very strong cultural challenge. Uh, there needs to be a lot of uh, alternatives provided uh, also. Um, to, to, to try to convince community members and, and you know, a, a demand from client that there's an alternative product that will have the same effect on you. Um, but I don't even think that, uh, I think, I think if, uh, if the ban on pangolin, for example, now that we've seen in China was that of a big success, we would still be celebrating. So the real issue is around, you know, how, how real is this? Is are these uh, policies? The problem is really about: Are we able to implement them? So I just it's kind of throwing back the question back to you know back to people living in the communities, unfortunately. Yeah, that we'll have to see whether the taking the the scales of the list actually means anything in real life, and whether whether that does affect the demand of you know what's what's out there or not. So that's, that's, that remains to be seen, but at least it's a move in the right direction. It seems we have a huge diversity of questions um, coming in, and I, I thought that it would be like this. So there's some questions on what does resilience mean in this um, in this project, but also on on the live, you know, in reality. Uh, if I look at uh, what people have been writing here, so it seems that there's a question also on this understanding that resilience maybe means jumping back. Uh, or bouncing back and then what does this mean for people on the ground and what is the T TFCA is doing about that just want to say maybe that I think in the work that we've been doing um, uh, we see resilience not as a kind of a just an adaptive bouncing back kind of a, a narrative or project but actually um, more radical than that is we see resilience as um, a community or landscape or project or a partnership <laughs> To be able to transform as a also as a kind of response uh, or as a as a way of being resilient or mode of being resilient. So it's not just about going back to business as usual or allowing people to carry on as they did before, because many um, many of these ideas then just reinforce maybe an unsustainable or exploitative way of being or a mode of being. But um, we're looking always at trying to see well in the face of change. What are transformative potentials within a project or a space or a community? And I think those are the, the, the places where innovation happens or where we see a little breakthrough or, you know, where power structures are changed and we can maybe use that. And those are also the, the kind of unexpected things that happen in a project or partnership um, that we maybe didn't plan for, but then, you know, allows us to some space where, where there's no opening, where communities could either become more self-reliant um, or where there's some kind of a, a knock-on effect where, where change happens in a way that, that actually allows an, an opening up for, for transformative processes to happen. Um, sort of just, just thinking about that, uh, it seems that this Resilient Waters project wants to, wants to use those ideas and the partnership and the idea of collaboration and, you know, forming formal structures and securing better governance structures. Um, well, um, it seems that there's um, a lot of space for not just, you know, bouncing back or thinking about adaptation, but really about transformation. Um, are they, are they sort of, um, in, so, in, so, so I think we want to also just, I just wanted to bring that into the discussion and, and say, it's not just, we also think about, um, you know, new and transformative um, ways in, in which these things open up. Um, someone, I think, all up in one of the questions also said that there are some quite resilient, you know, being dependent on bushmeat is quite a resilient strategy for some communities. So how do we, you know, how do we think of, of that not as resilience, but as, as something else that we can bring into that? What are the sort of transformative moments that we can open up towards that? Um, and then also, you know, where funding comes from, I think reason here also asked, it seems that there's a lot of funding coming from outside, but what are being done in this, pro, pro, you know, in governments or in, are there sort of social funds that are maybe being used for some kind of self-financing going forward? So there's a bunch of ideas just out there. 
there's some questions or the any responses that any of you would like to maybe just offer at this stage and yeah, maybe i can add just um, to what you were saying so i mean i think governance uh, is absolutely key and uh, you know, what we realized uh, through this TFCA is that we're trying to set up these, these cross-border governance structures that are inclusive, but these only work really well if the, 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 the nodal or the national or the, you know, the in-country structures are well organized. So, for instance, so I think one needs to get to a point uh, where, and I think Vince brought up the issue. So, you need to effectively provide a platform, uh, and we're doing it in some of the other initiatives, uh, there's a Jeff Seven initiative that's starting in next year with World Bank and some of the agencies in South Africa. But effectively, you need to make these, you know, in order to make these landscapes more productive and more vibrant and more sustainable, you need to make the governance arrangements more inclusive. So, for instance, in a, in a nodal situation or in a, in a country situation, you need to provide these structures in these clusters or nodes where people then can have more say in terms of planning and land use planning and decision making and, and implementation of specific initiatives on the one side. Um, so that is an important aspect that we're working on currently and we're also working with the resilient water specifically on the governance side and operationalizing these in-country structures and which will then feed into these cross-border structures. I mean, I think what we also saw, now see with COVID is that tourism you know, a lot of our thinking and our efforts are on tourism and supporting tourism development and using tourism as a as as, as sort of a uh, as a as an area that we that can provide sustainable income to communities. I think what we've realised now is we need to look much more. We need to have much more diverse strategy around uh, rural livelihoods and not only tourism. So we need to look at other maybe sustainable you know uses around wildlife or wildlife economy. Look definitely at food production and, and, and agriculture and, and areas with marine components, look at small scale uh, fisheries and all these things. But essentially, we need to create much more diverse economies. And not, you know, historically, a lot of the areas, um, tourism is the main driver around conservation based benefits to, to stakeholders or to communities. So we definitely need to look at going forward at, at creating much more diverse uh, rural economies, not around these parks and not only focusing on tourism. Yeah, that's key. And there's where the creativity and the opportunities for transformation also comes from, I think. But um, yeah, that, that would be a huge transformative moment, I think, to try and find to diversify those drivers for conservation. Christian Lola, are there some of the questions that are jumping at you that you see you'd like to to answer, I think there's questions about the use of groundwater and how, how could we be better pre prepared for the future. We've spoken about that. Um, the idea of sort of partnershiping and um, I see Sumati asked a question about um, uh, what, are, what is the role of cities or um, within your projects or are there sort of ways in, in you know, being able to, to link these areas to, to cities more and are there sort of options? Lola, would you like to respond? Um, yes, thank you, Rika. I wanted to um, I wanted to comment a little bit on the on the on the water project. So uh, I think the way that we uh, um, operate and the way that we are governed, um, there is a space to identify um, you know what are some of the uh, most scarce and most important uh, natural resources, you know, that we have within the GLTFCA landscape. So it came about very naturally as a concern for, you know, by the three countries to, you know, to have this, uh, have something of this sort uh, done, which was, uh, you know, in the form of a freshwater uh, management system. Um, also, this is this seems to be a good uh, a good uh, bridging way of connecting our work, you know, with from South Africa linking one of the parks, the using the the um, sorry the GLTFCA landscape and uh, the support also and how this links to the current support also that the Resilient Waters program is currently or the focus that it's putting currently uh, not only around the livelihoods of communities. Um, around uh, within and around the Limpopo National Park, but also 
um, uh, and helping to administer water uh, all the way from the Massinger Dam, which is going to happen through a, um, a zoning exercise, but all the way to um, to the sea, to Shai Shai uh, municipality, with whom Brazilian waters already have a very strong uh, partnership. Uh, so this is to say that uh, um, you know there are these strong areas of work for for our program, and then activities just keep on emerging as the need uh, uh, comes about. Um, and then I also wanted to mention about um, sorry, I forgot. Oh yes, it's about the funding uh, about funding for for conservation. And again, going back about the, the differences in, in the in the landscape that we work with. And, um, you know, you sense that South Africa is currently very concerned, you know, because uh, a big source of income comes from tourism. And, uh, you know, right in the beginning of this discussion, I was saying that it's completely different. I think it's even, it's different for Zimbabwe and for Mozambique. But we have a situation where uh, conservation sector, the conservation sector is being funded by external donors. All of our translocation processes, all of our management plans, everything that we do within the conservation sector in my country is funded by donors. So although we, at some point, we want to phase out and be able to, uh, to, to be self-sufficient and also at the same time try to gain some uh, ownership over, over the development uh, in, in this sector. I mean, this is the reality. So uh, right away, you can sense that uh, there's always going to be different positionings. And, uh, and it's certainly very interesting, lots of lessons to be learned and withdrawn in scenarios where for some, it can be extremely critical, you know, to suddenly not have that, that source of income, um, uh, you know, to pay your bills. Or not, nor, or and in the case of Mozambique, not to even have a contingency line to be able to cover for your sudden needs of soap and, and potable water. So we are having to deal with very different uh, scenarios working in this landscape. Thank you. Thanks. It's good to know, and it's good to hear also the different perspectives and the assumptions that inform how we think about different things and you know, what funding is good for, how things are being supported or not, and to just have a different perspective to see that and uh, what rich opportunity that is to, to learn and share. Christine. Yeah, and linked to that, a link to the Messenger project that Lola just spoke about. I mean, it's, it's really about protecting the water secure sources, protecting the water towers, and that leads all the way down to Shai Shai, but also in between that, we're setting up irrigation schemes for smallholder farmers as well, and so it's really about identifying these areas, improving, you know, access to water for the farmers. But then when it eventually leads to Shai Shai, it's increasing people's access to water at that level. So it's also just thinking holistically and, you know, making sure that, and it links to one of those questions that somebody said about the, the tourism. How do we build resilience in the tourism um, with a pandemic like this? And again, linking to what Pete said, it's about diversifying livelihood options. And maybe it is about small scale farming. Maybe it's about backyard farms, making sure that you know the where people produce the food is very close to the protected areas, to the to the tourists. So we don't have to import from South Africa, but make you know make it more sustainable within Mozambique. Um, because linked to that, we're also looking at um, reviewing and updating the management plans in. Um, Mozambique that's part of the Greater Limpopo Park. So we're looking at um, Zanav and Banin. And so when we're looking at the developing management plans, we need to look at the protected areas more holistically. It's not just a, how do you manage the park as an ecological island, but how do you take the communities into consideration? Can we build more like livelihood diversification options around the communities, look at farms, um, and look at backyard gardens and look at other options, not just tourism. Can we think of other ways of being more sustainable? Um, I think that's, that's really what we're trying to do at the end of the day, when this program ends, you know, we don't want, you know, our, all the funding needs to end, but the, the money we've put in, we're trying to build sustainability in the, in the community so they can carry on and um, beyond our footprint because our footprint is only five years. So I think that's really about thinking, thinking ahead and more sustainably. Yeah, that's really, really crucial. And um, I think I mean, one of one of the, uh, as I've just sort of been reading also about the project, um, I mean, this, pro this cross boundary project is probably one of the biggest such in, in Africa at the moment where it's trying to collaborate between countries. Are they, are they sort of um, 
I might want to sort of just, I see we just have about four minutes left and maybe just to ask each of you if you would um, know, if you were looking, are there sort of bright spots out there? Um, are there examples, uh, other places in Africa or in the world that are doing interesting things? How um, are there things where, where, you know, these kinds of communities or conservation projects have been able to push through the boundaries of, thinking about conservation by itself or just being tourism related um, or is what you're doing I think well I have an idea that it's probably groundbreaking and that we are breaking barriers and boundaries here but maybe just uh, yeah if you and and on the other hand if you had to um, had a perfect scenario what would your what would your sort of uh, gold standard be or your your perfect scenario would be what what is it how in which way could we support you um what do you need support um to, to do this break groundbreaking work maybe each of you just a, a last sentence or two responding to each to either of those questions yeah man, i can go first um look it's quite a tricky question um i think there are good examples across the region of, of different things. And I mean, I think, uh, you know, for one in South Africa, we can learn a lot from other examples in the region. Cause I mean, a lot of these programs initiatives, you know, it's not new, it's been going on for 30 or 40 or 50 years. So I think, you know, you know, we've got, uh, you know, we see increased interest in these learning and knowledge sharing, uh, knowledge sharing exchange programs where people go and learn from, what, what uh, you know, from other countries and other initiatives to see what worked and what didn't work. Um, you know, the trick with all these, uh, the issue around these transboundary initiatives is that it, it takes long, so it needs resources. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not something that, that seemingly happened over a year or two. You know, it's like Christy was saying, you know, they put a five-year program, but after that, you know, there's only so much you can achieve. So it's actually always takes much longer uh, than anticipated. And I think, you know, one needs to be realistic and, and maybe focus and not trying to overpromise and overachieve, but rather try and see where one can support and, and start looking at developing a model or some of these models that are actually scalable across the landscape. But it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a quite tricky, um, but it's, it's exciting. I mean, I think COVID is going to bring a whole lot of different opportunities because people are being innovative and, and it creates a lot of uh, opportunity for things that weren't there. So with any crisis, there's opportunities uh, around going forward and new innovation and new interest from stakeholders. So. Thanks. Thanks for that, Pete. Lola. Um, hi. So, you know, following following the statement from, uh, from, from Pete and, and from what you were saying also, I think uh, within the GLTFCA, we've tried to have a very inclusive uh, platform and there's no, uh, you know, we've been very vocal about, you know, the importance and how we consider, um, you know, Brazilian Waters Program and uh, USAID support to be extremely important. And I think we've had, a, we're very comfortable to have a plat platform where you've been listening the same input that we have and heard uh, some real struggles. And I think we've had, we've been able to receive uh, some of your um, support exactly to fill fill some of the gaps that we were um, experiencing uh, as as as, uh, as players in this uh, in this um, uh, large uh, landscape. So I think uh, continuity of uh, you know of these open discussions and conversations around how we can um, best. Um, make use of our efforts and really make a difference in the lives of the people really and and the wildlife in this landscape is uh, is key to us and, and we really value your support in, in this you know the road going forward thank you thanks lola christy the last word's yours <laughs> i think it's just adding on what lola said i, I think it's really about inclusivity and it's something we didn't touch upon but I, there was a question about gender and i think what we really need to do is, is be more, you know, focus more on gender equity and social inclusion. And I think that's where the strengths are. And we are trying to, you know, I mean, it's quite a big project. We're trying to reach across different countries, different stakeholders, but I think it's also across 
different genders and and youth. I think we need to you know focus more on the youth and it's also more about awareness. So there's there's a lot to think about. Um, but I think if we're especially looking at the youth, there's a lot to be positive about. Um, so I think we should also remember that and remember remember where we come from and and know that our future lies lies in good hands. So I think I think we'll be good. But yeah. It's about inclusivity, really, at the end of the day. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. And with that, we reached the end of our, of our webinar today. I think it was fantastic learning for me and to just hear what happens on the ground and what this means in practice and to just also listen to your voices and your, hear your stories and the, the passion and the authenticity behind each of you and what you just brought to the conversation is just made this all more real for me even as a, as a project partner. So thank you very much for that. And thank you for your time. We'll be sharing all the questions that, that have been asked in the chat box and in the question and answer boxes with the presenters. And um, we'll be posting this video on the CST webpage afterwards by next week. And we'll be continuing next week with uh, a few more um, themes uh, also throughout July. So thank you everyone for being with us and for the questions you've asked and for sharing with us. Um, it's been lovely and thank you so much for everyone's input. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you everybody.